question? Yes, please. Right, so if you have read and understood, <coughs> considering a communication skills station, kindly continue, kindly begin. Uh, hello, my name is uh, Fosia. I'm one of the surgical doctors here. Can I confirm your name and age? Hello, um, I'm Roland. I'm 55 years old. Um, nice to meet you, Roland, and thanks for confirming. Uh, today, I have been asked to uh, talk to you about a uh, procedure that we would like to arrange for you. Good. Uh, would that be okay? Uh, yes, 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 doctor. Uh, can I ask you what you already know about the procedure so far? Do you have any idea about it? Not at all. I don't know anything about it. Uh, yeah, I'm sure. Uh, I'm glad I could help you today. Um, so we are planning a uh, um, OGD for you. It's called as esophagogastrodentoscopy, and it's abbreviated as OGD. This is a, a camera test, a small camera, which is called as endoscope, uh, which is uh, passed through the mouth, down the food pipe, into the stomach, to Good. have a look inside the lining of uh, the, uh, to have a look uh, what is causing your symptoms. Uh, would that, did you get me so far? Uh, yes, yes, doctor. Uh, when you say camera, is it, is it painful? Basically, we have two ways to go for the uh, the uh, procedure. One is uh, we will spray a, a local anesthetic on your uh, on your throat to make the posterior uh, to make the back of your throat numb, and uh, then you will feel a bit discomfort, but as such, it will not be painful. And the uh, second way is we can use some uh, medicines uh, or drugs uh, that will make you sleepy decrease the pain and you will not be aware of the procedure after that. And uh, the disadvantages you, with using, using sedation is you need an, a responsible adult with you to drive you back home and Good. have with you for at least 24 hours until the effects of the uh, medicine are gone. Okay, doctor. Um, so wh how, wh how does the camera work? Like if I if you put the camera into my into my throat, it's like it's like the it's small uh, camera, uh, size of a um, uh, like a small pens, and uh, it uh, it works through a fiber optic system, and it carries the uh, it carries the image and displays it on a monitor. The images are magnified, so we can have a close look uh, at the inside of the food pipe, stomach, and the upper intestine. And uh, while having a look, we will get to know what is suspicious or if there is anything abnormal. At the same time, we will be able to take some tissue samples from the suspicious areas to help us with the diagnosis, what is causing your symptoms. Okay, doctor. Doctor, are there any risks involved? Can I get any... Uh, uh I'm, I'm glad you uh, asked about it. Uh, unfortunately, no procedure is without any risk. Most people um, feel it like it's discom it causes a, a discomfort and, uh, there are, and there may be injury to the teeth while uh, doing uh, the procedure, but we usually use mouth guard and it, this doesn't usually happen. And some patients experience some soreness in the throat after, uh, for around uh, one, two days. And uh, there are risks like bleeding from the site where we take the tissue sample, but it's usually minor and settles of its own. But there is a risk of tearing the uh, lining or of the uh, food pipe, which yeah. is a serious complication. And uh, it, it usually doesn't happen because the 
person who does it are well experienced in it. That sounds very scary, doctor. What if I don't want the operation anymore? Uh, I, as I told you, uh, the uh, chances of it happening are low, and the person or the doctors who are uh, who are allowed to do it have are uh, very are very experienced and quite are and are quite skilled in it. So the chances are very low, but I had to mention it. Okay, um, doctor. Is it possible that I have cancer because I just keep I just keep salivating all the time, and I read it's, that I could be cancer. Uh, it's a thing that we want to rule out. It's one of the possibilities, but uh, we can't be sure at present. As I told you earlier, we will take some tissue samples from this uh, from the suspicious areas, and the tissue samples uh, will tell us what it is actually and what it what is causing your symptoms. But at present, uh, it's very difficult to say what it is. Okay, uh, um, doctor, how long how, how long do I have to wait for the results to, to come out? The tissue the tissue samples and the reports uh, take around two to three weeks, and when the reports are ready, we will see in your in our OPD clinic with the uh, report, and we will let you know what the results are at that time. And I think you should bring some uh, relative or a close friend with you at that time. It will be easy for you. Okay. Um, what if I don't have anybody to come with me, doctor? Uh, it's okay. If you are okay to come by yourself, uh, you can come. Okay. Okay. Um, so if there's something abnormal with my results, what, what, what next? What am I going to do, have done next? If the uh, results are abnormal, uh, then we will discuss in the multidisciplinary team and we will uh, discuss what, for, where, where dif where, what further we need to do. And the de various decisions what we will uh, take will depend on your decisions too and what we will discuss in the MDD. What's an MDD? I'm sorry, I should have mentioned it before. It's a multidisciplinary team. If something abnormal comes out, then uh, various uh, doctors or various specialties come together and they uh, discuss the various aspects of what, uh, what further we are going to uh, do, what tests and what, how to treat it. Okay. I'm just really concerned I might have cancer, doctor. Um, I, I can understand your concern, uh, but it's, early, uh, to, it's too early to, think, uh, to keep on thinking about it. It's the thing we need to rule out, a dangerous thing. And that's why we are offering you this uh, or arranging this uh, test for you to be sure that what it is and to rule out it, if it is cancer. But we should keep our fingers crossed and do the test and follow what uh, comes. Um, would I also be able to swallow better after the procedure? Uh, well, uh, if uh, as your investigation has uh, you, the investigation you have previously done as well, I was going through your notes, is showing that uh, the investigation you have done before is showing small nar uh, narrowing at the lower end of your food pipe. So uh, under sedation, we will try to uh, dilate it to make the opening wider, uh, kind of. So there will be some relief of symptoms of uh, drooling uh, after the procedure. Okay. Okay, thank you, doctor. We can uh, ask could you uh, about the eating around the time of OGD. Okay, uh, yeah. Um, uh, yes. Yeah, if, uh, if you, uh, basically we have to uh, see the uh, clearly, so we need you to keep uh, fasting for some hours. If you are planned in the morning, uh, then I'll, uh, I'll advise you to take uh, nothing for oral from midnight. But you can have sips of water after two hours before the surgery. And if you are uh, planned for OGD in the afternoon, then you will take a, a light uh, breakfast in the early morning. And uh, similarly, you can take clear sips of water up to two hours before the procedure. Okay, okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Good, thanks. Uh, one question that you could have asked about the alternative uh, procedure. Did you ask? Uh, I asked that what if I don't want the procedure, but and this one. She, yeah. It was really, she didn't really give me an alternative. Yeah, uh, just that uh, I think you missed. 
uh, you could have mentioned that the alternative procedure that can be done, you've already done it, uh, but the barium enema, yes, barium swallow. Okay, good. Thank you, ma'am. Thanks. Yeah. Started the timer and here is your question. Yes, ma'am. All right, so if you have read and understood, considering it communication skills session, kindly begin. Kindly begin. Hello, I'm Dr. Yes. Muhammad, one of the surgical doctor. Yes. May I confirm your name and age, please? Uh, hello, doctor. I'm Thomas. I'm 65 years old. Hello. Hello, doctor. I'm Thomas. I'm 65 years old. Hello, I'm Dr. Mohammed, an exam surgical doctor. May I confirm your name and age, please? Hello, doctor. Nice I'm Thomas. You. I'm 65 years old. Nice to meet you, Thomas. Continue, Dr. Mohammed. Can, yes. hard to understand what he's so, saying. Sorry, doctor. I did not understand that. Could you please repeat again? His network is bad, I think. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. I cannot hear him. But he's talking. I can see. Continue, yes. please. Hello, I'm Dr. Mohammed, an exam surgical doctor. May I confirm your name and age, please? Hello, doctor. I'm Thomas. I'm 65 years old. Nice to meet you. Can you have a seat, please? I have Thank been you. told that you have some concern regarding your health. Can you tell me your apprehension towards this, please? Uh, yes, doctor. Uh, you see, I have been asked by my surgeon that I have to stop taking warfarin, this medication I'm taking for my heart. But you see, my cardiologist told me not to stop it at any cost because it is quite life threatening for me then if I do so. So I'm really worried about stopping warfarin. Okay. Firstly, let me tell you what is warfarin and how it's act. Okay. Warfarin is medication which we use to thin your blood and to prevent formation of clot. As in your case, you have artificial heart valve. We are using it to prevent formation of clot on your valves, okay? Mm -hmm. So we are going to operate on you. So also we need to prevent uh, bleeding during and after surgery. So we need to stop it five days because it's, uh, it's uh, Action, it is prolonged for five days, but no worries, we will give you another medication which is called heparin, mm -hmm. which, is, uh, which is act uh, for 12 hours. So you need to stop it 
was our before sale okay but why heparin okay heparin this is has the same action as warfarin but the difference is warfarin is action for five days but heparin it is for only 12 hours you we just need it to stop it only 12 hours before surgery unlike warfarin you have to stop it five days before surgery so you so will i not uh, restart my warfarin after the operation or something uh, no we you ha we have you will start your warfarin after surgery but we need to show that there is no bleeding after surgery. And also we, you will use all, both of the warfarin and heparin, but we will do some investigation until we assure that warfarin has regained its function. Do I have to stay long in the hospital then? Uh, unfortunately, yes, you have to stay for five days. During these five years, we will give you the injectable drugs, which is called heparin. Okay. And it shouldn't cause any problem to my other medications that I'm taking, right? Uh, what's the, after the medication, you will continue to take your other medications until the uh, morning of the operation. But with oh. only sleep of water. Uh, do you need to do some tests on me then? Uh, yes, we have to do some blood tests just to make sure that your warfarin has a start again functions. Okay. 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 Uh, all right, doctor, I understand. Okay. Uh, okay. Before that we have been through, you have artificial valves and you are taking warfarin but you will stop it five days before the operation and at the same time we have to do, uh, give you some uh, other precautions like give you drugs which is called heparin which you will only stop it 12 hours before the surgery after the surgery until we assure that there is no bleeding we will continue using warfarin and heparin until we do some investigation and make sure warfarin has regained its function, then we will stop the heparin. The sound. Okay. Okay. Okay, thank you, uh, doctor. We are all here, here to help you and give you our hand. If you have any other inquiries, don't hesitate to contact me. I will leave my number with Thanks for your understanding. You still have two minutes. Uh, Thank you, you doctor. Explain, uh, patient can ask you if you are supposed to take both heparin and warfarin together at the same time. Do I have to take heparin and warfarin together at the same time, uh, doctor? Yes, you, we will give you the... Yes, but only after we do some investigation, it will be for the short time until we make sure that your warfarin has gained its function, then we will stop using the heparin. Okay. Okay. Yes, okay. Do you have any other inquiries you would like to ask me about any other thing? How long mm -hmm. the patient has to stay in hospital? Um, um, he no, said already, ma'am. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Then at the end, you can summarize. Yes, ma'am. He, he summarized, ma'am. All right. So what uh, else was left? Oh, uh, I've asked about other medications. He's he answered that. Yes, yes ma'am. And ma then who oh, lives uh, at home with him? Who can manage? Oh yeah. Sorry. To admit, uh, like uh. Patient lives alone at home, so you can offer that a nursing manager or a, a social services can be arranged mm. and provided. Yes, as you as you live alone, in your, I will rearrange with our social workers just to help you in this period before your surgery. Oh, all right. Thank you so much, doctor. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Still, uh... 
28 seconds are left. Are you sure you people cannot hear the noise? Because I'm getting really really noise. No, ma'am. There is no, no ma'am. No, okay. no, there is no background noise. Thankfully, not, not loud enough. Okay. Is it? But it is there. You said not loud yeah. enough, but it is there. It's it, it will suffice, ma'am. <laughs> yes, it is. We can hear you loud and clear. Yes, ma'am. Because I'm getting disturbed with it. Okay. Right. So yes, now timer. Good. It was good. Good communication with among both of you. So, Doctor Ulfat, can you please give feedback first? Yes, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, he did really well. Uh, he's he's doing really well as days go on. Yes. And uh, uh, he answered all the questions that were uh, addressed. And uh, he was sympathetic. He was understanding. Yes. Uh, but uh, when uh, when he was uh, when he was leaving, so since you know this patient is uh, legally blind, so yeah. uh, uh, mm -hmm. the thing comes question. as to you know, yes. the question comes as to how he's going to approach, mm -hmm. and then how yes. he leaves the patients as yes. in the sentence like uh, last time I, I took a note from Dr. Fozzi I think who did it yeah, that yeah. Do you need any help to uh, leave do you need any assistance like asking these simple yes. questions yeah. would be, uh, really, showing uh, considering uh, empathy. considering yes will, would be considering uh, uh, empathy so that would be really good then yeah, so yeah. otherwise you did really Thank good you. I have just some inquiry about the time what if I finish like two minutes earlier? <laughs> don't do that <laughs> in exam. No, don't do that in exam. Take your time because uh, it's, it has uh, eight minutes. So take your time. If uh, still think that if you have missed anything, then you can ask again um, okay. and take your time. Yes. Um, I have one question. Yes. Uh, well, uh, this uh, station like communication or phone call, uh, this is lead by the uh, the patient or the doctor on call, yes. right? We have to answer them according accordingly. But when uh, we finish our station like one minute or two minutes before, so what should we do? Like after summarization and everything, like should we sit and like what what we have to do at that point? uh sorry <laughs> what you have to do when like after finishing the station like uh, yes. two minutes or one minute before the time uh, you have summarized peacefully you say uh, you leave the number with the nurse if there is any question or any uh, confusion comes ar comes uh, around or arises then you can uh, think okay still there is minutes or seconds left you can offer okay can i assist you in getting uh, out of the opd or uh, it's yes uh, it's day opd or day surgery or whatever so you have read in the stem where the patient is at the moment uh, then you can like ask so it depends on the scenario and depends on the how many time or minute or seconds are left considering that, uh, make sure you utilize that time nicely. Offer. Okay, ma'am. Or, uh, yes, polite or uh, keep the patient like in a conversation. Started your timer and here is your question. Right, so if you have read and understood, considering it clinical examination station,
kindly begin. Okay. Um, hello, I'm Dr. Faria. I'm one of the exam candidate. Could I check your name and age, please? Um, Lisa, 23 years old. Hello, Lisa. Nice to meet you. Today, I've been asked to examine some of the nerves that supply your ear, face, head, and neck. And yes. also, I am asked to examine your ear. Is that okay with you? Yes. Okay. So first, I'm going to examine some nerves that supply your ear. Okay. Yes. So uh, could you uh, please uh, raise your eyebrow without moving your head for me? Okay. Patient did it. Continue, please. Okay. Uh, could you please try to close your eyes as uh, as much as possible and don't let me open it okay okay and uh, could you please uh, puff out your cheek and then uh, could you please show me your teeth and okay. then uh, could you please uh, tense your neck muscles for me and uh, then i will try uh, to examine uh, her according to enough i'll ask her about uh, the change in any kind of taste sensation uh, in her tongue okay okay uh, then I'll go for the vestibular cochlear nerve examination. First, I will do the equilibrium test. So to see that, I will uh, ask the patient, could you please close your eyes and put your uh, hands uh, by your sides and put your feet together? I will be here. Uh, if you feel any kind of instability, I will support you, okay? So then okay. I will see the equilibrium and then I will go for the hearing. First, I will uh, uh, see uh, the patient's hearing test. I will go from 30 centimeter and 50, uh, 15 centimeter uh, of, on, from both distance, I will use by a word and I'll ask the patient to repeat the word with me okay. as he or she uh, hears it. And then I will go for the uh, rhinitz test. For, so for the rhinitz test, I will ask the patient, this is a tuning fork. What I'm going to do, I'm going to vibrate it and that's how it uh, feels. So I will put this tuning fork over her head and then I will tell them, uh, tell her that uh, I will put this tuning fork behind your ear and you will tell me as long as you, you hear it. And when you stop hearing it, you tell me I will put it in front of your ear. So I will do it. And then when it stops, the patient will tell me that it stopped. And then I will put it in front of her hair, uh, ear. So um, I will see that if uh, the ear conduction is greater than bone conduction, then it is normal and rhinitz positive. And if it is uh, the bone conduction is greater than ear conduction, then I will think that rhinitz is negative and uh, it is due to the conductive deafness. And uh, okay. after that, I will go for the Weber's test. I will tell the patient that uh, now I'm going to vibrate this tuning fork and I'm going to put this in your uh, forehead, uh, in the middle of your forehead. And tell me uh, if you hear it equally or if you hear uh, louder or uh, in your in any of your ear. Then I'll, uh, I will ask the patient if it is normal, then the patient will hear equally on her both ear. And if it is conductive deafness, then the patient will hear louder in the affected ear. And if it is sensorineural deafness, then the patient will hear uh, uh, louder in the unaffected ear. And after that, I will go for the uh, ear examination by otoscope. I will introduce the otoscope to the patient. Then uh, this is an otoscope. Uh, uh, with uh, its help, I'm going to examine uh, your ear. I'm going to be very gentle. It's not going to hurt you. Then I will, uh, for the right ear, I will uh, hold the otoscope with my right hand. And then I will uh, hold it like a pencil and I uh, support my hand over patient's cheek. And then I'm going to uh, uh, take the pinna uh, upward and backward. And uh, that's how I'm going to, uh, then I'm going to slowly put the otoscope inside the ear and I'm going to first see if there is any foreign body, if there is any wax soiling, any kind of uh, discharge uh, uh, in the external auditory meters. Then I'm going to see the tympanic membrane. First, I'm going to see the color of the membrane. Uh, normal color is a pearly white. If there is any erythema, if there is any uh, perforation, uh, if there is any, uh, I will also see the cone of light. So if there is any otitis media, the cone of light will be absent. I will also see any kind of perforation is present or not, or any kind of bleeding is present or not inside uh, her uh, ear cavity. And uh, uh, after that, uh, Autoscopic examination. I'm going. I'm. I'll. I'll ask the examiner that uh, after uh, completing the seventh and eighth nerve and the uh, autoscopic examination. Now I'm. I'm going to. Uh, I want to do the rest of the cranial nerve examination. Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, so uh, for the olfactory nerve, I'll ask the patient. Could you please close your eyes and uh, uh, put your one nostril close for me? And I'm going to give you uh, something. You need to uh, get the smell and tell me the name of it. So that's how I'm going to uh, test the olfactory nerve. And then after that, I will go to, going to do the optic nerve examination. 
So for uh, the visual acuity, I'll ask the patient, could you please, uh, this is the snail chart in the wall. I want you to sit uh, six meter away from this chart and what I need you to do, you need to uh, uh, read the lines uh, uh, at the, as, the, as, as much lowest as possible as you can manage. So then patient will be uh, reading. And I, uh, before that, I'll ask the patient if uh, he or she needs a glass or if he or she needs to wear the glass regularly or not. If they wear the glass, then I will ask them to wear the glass and uh, do this test. So uh, then I will uh, see the patient's visual acuity. The distance will be the uh, numerator and the lowest line, the patient, uh, lowest number of line that the patient read, that will be the denominator of the visual acuity test. And after that, I'll go for the pupil. To see the yes. pupil, I'll ask the patient that uh, this eye will shine a torch into one of your eye. I, I want you to put your hand middle of your uh, or nose to give a partition. And I, what I'm going to do, I'm going to shine the torch in your one eye and I'm going to see the pupil of your both eye. That's how I'm going to see the uh, direct right to place oh, and right. the positive right. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Can you then summarize I'll... your case now, please? Okay. So today I've been asked to examine Lisa. A 30 years old girl who has uh, presented with uh, uh, head trauma. So yes. on examination of her uh, facial nerve, um, I have found uh, her uh, uh, facial uh, uh, nerve intact, but uh, her I have found uh, some hearing uh, loss and uh, Rani was negative. And uh, Weber's, uh, on Weber's test, it was lateralized to the normal ear, but her equilibrium was normal. On otoscopy examination, I found uh, some swelling and uh, some uh, erythematous and uh, some uh, perforation in her uh, uh, tympanic membrane. Also, the, there was erythema and uh, 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 yes, and the uh, light to reflex was absent. Okay, what about the conducting deafness and? Uh, so, uh, conductive deafness uh, uh, on her uh, uh, left, uh, on her both uh, left eye, uh, left ear. Okay, anything else? Any other positive finding? You did otoscope examination as well. What did you see? You have to uh, tell so, okay. quickly. Okay, so on otoscope examination, I found uh, there was a discharge and there was a swelling on tympanic membrane. The tympanic color of the tympanic membrane was erythematous. There was a perforation, light reflex Very good. was absent. Okay, okay. How, how do you plan to manage this patient? Uh, so um, in this uh, patient, first, as this patient is uh, uh, after uh, after her accident, I will manage this patient according to the ATLS protocol after ABCDE management and uh, autoscopy examination. I will uh, I want to do the CT brain yes. and uh, also the audiometry, and I will uh, I will take the review from the ENT uh, department. Okay, what is the role of doing hormone assays in this condition? Uh, hormone this assays. Patient? Uh, is, is there any role or not uh, in this patient? Yes, please. Uh, I don't no. think so. No, no, no. So. It's a trauma patient. Yes, it's a trauma patient. So you should be able to tell me no. Okay. okay. So what is the treatment that you can offer? Uh, so after, if uh, there is a tympanic membrane perforation, uh, they, then uh, we have to wait and uh, uh, to see, uh, we have, we, we will see the uh, size of the perforation according to the side of the perforation, we will manage uh, this patient's uh, tympanic membrane rupture uh, after reviewing with the ENT. Okay, good. Thank you. Uh, it was very good. All right. Uh, Thank if, you, ma'am. Did you do the gag reflex? Uh, did you check for the glossopharyngeal? No, no, ma'am. I only did the seventh and eighth cranial now. Seventh and eighth. Okay. Yes. Right. Yeah. But then you could have said if time would have allowed you, you would have completed the remaining cranial nerves. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, ma'am, I said that uh, after finishing autoscopic, then I told like I want to do rest of the cranial nerve. Is there yeah, any you preference? Said Yes, ma'am. No, Is there any preference? No, no, no. There's no preference. But then uh, the ones you could tell me, you told me a, a few, but then you couldn't completely tell me all. So the ones which were left, you could have told me, uh, like when you were summarizing the case, that uh, if time would have allowed me, mm -hmm. I would have completed the ones which were left. Okay. Proclear, oclomotor, and yeah. Those. Yeah. Okay, can you please tell me where the cone of light is in this one? And this uh, is what and from which side? 
Uh, ma'am, uh, this is uh, uh, this is a hemotympanum, but uh, here okay. I cannot see a cone of light. It is absent because the erythematous. Uh, it's uh, not of the patient. It's uh, mm -hmm. someone else. Uh, who yes. would who would tell, Doctor Karma? Can you please yes, tell? Yes. Yeah, this this is the left uh, tympanic membrane because the yes. cone of light it lies in the seven o'clock direction. Yeah, can you see now? Shown. Yes, ma'am. I'm asking Dr. Faria. Can you well, see now? Uh, ma'am, uh, seven o'clock position. Yes, where uh, would that be? Okay, okay. Yes, ma'am. I can Just see. below yes. the umbo. Yes, yes, ma'am. Yes. Below the umbo. Yes, okay. now you can see. Okay, yes. uh, right. The, right here, it's on the five o'clock. Yes. Now you have to okay. learn because in the exam, this is the difference that they ask to tell okay. from okay. which side it is and in what cranial. So it's the vestibular cochlear uh, mostly. You told me okay. yourself how you'll uh, use the otoscope. How is it different if you have to use otoscope in a child? Examination mm. would be. I'm sorry, ma'am. I don't know. Can uh, who would tell Dr. Karma? Can you please tell? Yeah, in adult, it uh, the we have to uh, pull the ear backwards and upwards. Yes. In the child, backwards and straight backwards, because the tympanic okay. membrane is almost horizontal in the child. Yes, backward and straight. Oh. Yeah. yeah. Nicely presented. You have you are very slick and uh, you. I mean, you covered most of the things, like yeah, ninety nine percent of the things. <laughs> yes, I just like Thank one you. or two things that you missed, missed. maybe like yes. Uh, in the whisper, you you have to do at the fifteen and sixty, not thirty, okay? And uh, okay, fifteen. And when you go for the olfactory nerve, before you ask the patient to smell, you have to ask patient whether there is any whether he or she noticed any change in the smell recently. Smell. And in the facial nerve, you did ask about the taste sensation. You could also ask about uh, whether uh, he or she is hearing uh, the noise louder than normal, hyperacusis. Hyper yes. And uh, okay. for the practice, I what I felt was like, because in the real exam scenario, you cannot go the, this fast like how you are going. So I was just thinking okay. like you have to examine only two cranial nerves here. So maybe yeah. you could uh, you could think about the exam scenario and then you could mm. go you could keep your pace like that so that yeah, uh, according yes. that it could be the real exam you are doing in the real exam because if you do this fast in the exam you will you have to go slow because you have to examine in real patient mm -hmm. or act actor so maybe you might miss some points so if you go at yes. the same pace of the exam then maybe you will not miss point because you will be practicing for real. Good. That's what I told me. Okay. Very good. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. And here is your question. Right, so if you have read and understood, considering it communication skills station, kindly begin. Hello, I'm Dr. Mamuna, one of the surgical trainee in uh, this hospital, working under uh, Dr. Samreen. So uh, I'm here to uh, speak, Mr. John, a hepatobiliary surgeon, and uh, about regarding a patient. Uh, can I confirm to whom I'm speaking at the moment? Yeah, it's me. Uh, 
John. Uh, with which hospital you said? The Whitland Hospital in London. Okay. Okay. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Dr. John. Uh, if you don't mind, can I summarize my case? Yes, please. Yes, please go on. Okay, a young lady, uh, 44 year old, four days ago, we performed laparoscopic cholecystectomy. Uh, since yesterday, she has a complaint of abdominal pain. Uh, we have noticed a bile leakage from uh, her drain. Clinically, she is tachycardic and uh, having high uh, temperature mm -hmm. and uh, she's slightly jaundiced. On the lab investigation, uh, we noticed that TLC is elevated along with C-reactive protein and bilirubin. On ultrasound, uh, it indicated uh, free intra-abdominal collection. Um, so we are suspecting that a uh, patient has a bile leakage uh, on this regard, I'm calling you to transfer and uh, you, uh, I need your advice on this patient as well as we want to transfer this patient in under your specialty. Okay, doctor. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned that you found uh, free fluid in the abdomen. Well, what does that indicate? Well, it indicating uh, it might be a leakage from a common bile duct or maybe uh, the uh, clip uh, uh, leaked or slipped uh, during uh, laparoscopic cholecystectomy, which we used. So you are sus you're suspecting that there might be a bile leak. Can you tell um, me what could be the reasons or possible causes of bile leak in this patient? Well, in this patient, as uh, uh, it might be because of the sl uh, slip clips of the uh, cystic uh, duct, uh, duct stump, and uh, during, uh, or maybe because of the uh, retained CBD stone, or uh, it might be because of the CBD injury or leakage from the liver bed or accessory cystic duct may be possibility. Okay. So why do you think the CRP is raised? Well, um, CRP is an acute for, uh, phase protein. It uh, mostly, increase in the, um, in the uh, uh, inflammatory uh, reasons. And it might be because of the operation as well, but four days are passed and it, uh, the trend is showing that it is increasing. So it might be because of the, um, uh, any uh, bile leakage or any um, uh, intra-abdominal uh, inflammation. Okay. So what will be your management? How will you manage this patient? Uh, well, uh, yes, doctor. I um, uh, and keep uh, the patient NPO, and I start full uterus resuscitation and uh, along with antibiotics, and uh, I will order new sets of uh, all the uh, baseline investigation as well. And um, uh, we are planning for ERCP. That's the main reason I uh, we are uh, transferring this patient into your um, specialty. Because unfortunately, at the moment in our hospital, we cannot perform ERCP. Okay, so oh, can you tell me how we, how will we do the ERCP and what will be the uh, what will be the you know help with this ERCP? Yes, for this yes doctor. Um, ERCP is basically endoscopic retrograde cholangio uh, uh, pancreaticography. In this, uh, what we do is, and uh, the flexible telescope is passed uh, uh, from esophagus to duodenum, and uh, then the dye is passed into the CBD, uh, through which um, you know, all the CBD, cystic duct, and the hepatic duct all uh, can uh, all are seen by taking the X-ray. So it uh, basically it showed the any extravasation of the dye, any region of the abdomen, if there is a perforation of any region uh, throughout the dye, uh, dye passage. Okay. Uh, does he have, does she have any drain? Uh, yes, uh, the drain is uh, placed in the uh, right side of the uh, uh, abdomen. Okay, uh, did you check Pardon. on the collection? Sorry. Did you check on the drain? Uh, yes. Uh, is there any the collection? 
Uh, yes, the uh, drain, uh, since morning, there is a bile leakage uh, from the drain. Okay, so there's a collection of bile in the drain. Yeah. Yes, doctor. Uh, did you check on her tummy, on her abdomen? Uh, yes, on the uh, what exam did you find? examination, I noticed that the abdomen is tender, uh, but it's soft. Uh, so, uh, uh, and, the, and the temperature is raised as well. Okay. So, do you think this is an urgent case? Uh, yes, doctor. It's um, urgent because uh, it might be caused the biliary peritonitis if we uh, did not perform anything at the moment. Okay, okay. So, how, how do you want to arrange now? Do you need to arrange with anyone else? Uh, yes, um, I will contact the bed manager of both the hospitals and I will ask if possible uh, the beds are available so we can shift the patient into your specialty. Okay, how are you going to transport this patient? Um, one of uh, my uh, one of the uh, registrar will come along with this patient or if that's not possible, then I will uh, shift the patient by myself. In, in any any special ambulance you want to use? Ah uh, yes, uh, uh, I will. Uh, we will uh, comply by ITU registrar, and uh, uh, we need all the uh, basic required uh, ambulance. Like what? Like uh, for the acute management, uh, we need all the resuscitations and everything. Okay, okay, that sounds nice. Okay, so I think uh, you can talk with the bed manager and then if it is done, you can refer the patient. Okay, um, if you want, can, uh, I can summarize my patient again uh, or do you want to uh, ask anything else? No, it's okay. No, uh, you can refer the patient. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Did she tell what is uh, binary peritonitis? Yeah. Explained. Okay. All right. Sure. What is the name of the ambulance in which you are going to? What does it call? Advance Life Support Ambulance something. Okay. Dr. Uh, Karma, can you give feedback first? Uh, thank you, Dr. Dr. Memona. Uh, it was nice. You uh, answered all the qu uh, questions that I tried to ask. And uh, you you were good. You managed it well. And uh, this ambulance, uh, you you need, uh, you can't, uh, you, you have to be specific and not basic. You have to say that it needs the uh, equipment for, you know, resuscitation. Okay. CPR okay. and all. Yeah. Beside, uh, now you know the name. But uh, Blue yes, lighted ambulance. Yes. Equipped, yeah. That you will say afterwards, yes. But then um, uh, what I felt then, uh, okay, it was good. You kept the conversation going and you knew what you were answering. Thanks. Thank you, ma'am. Thank, Thank you. you. Started your timer and here is your question. Right, so if you have read and understood, 
kindly tell me how would you tell the patient about its illness yes uh, first of all i'll need to explain to patient about the symptoms and then i'll come to the uh, uh, ogd and the biopsy findings and also okay. uh, the lab investigation revealing that he had hypercalcemia then the okay. diag uh, diagnosis according to the biopsy was uh, peptic ulcer disease and yes. uh, he had hypercalcemia which could uh, probably indicate that he has uh, a problem with his parathyroid gland most yes. probably it could be hyperparathyroidism yes can you first define the term ulcer what does it mean yeah, to you ulcer it is a bridge in the uh, continuity of the mucous membrane or the uh, skin or mucous membrane Okay. Can you tell me what are the risk factors that contribute to the development of uh, peptic ulcer disease? Yeah, certain risk factors, uh, H. pylori infection, it could be NSAIDs, smoking. Yeah. Stress, alcohol, corticoid, alcohol, steroid yeah. intake, etc. Okay. Uh, right. In this patient, can you tell me why the patient presented with hypercalcemia? Here, uh, most probably, patient has a hyperparathyroidism, ma'am, because okay. of which, yeah, yes, because of which patient has a hypercalcemia. All right. Uh, how would you? What are the tests or what are the options available to diagnose H. pylori infection? Yeah, H. pylori. <clears throat> we can do the flow test. That is the campylobacter like organism test, which is also okay. called as rapid urease test. Here, yes. uh, it, it is based on the urease, which is produced by the H. pylori uh, bacteria. So here we take a biopsy with the OGD, where which, which this, biopsy, this specimen is placed in a medium, which contain the which contain contain urea with an indicator phenol red. Yes, and uh, this specimen uh, contains H. pylori, then it will, because of the urease production, it will break down urea to ammonia, which will increase the pH and then change the color. How can H. pylori be eradicated? Yeah, we have the uh, triple therapy and the quadruple therapy. Yes. And the triple therapy, uh, we can give uh, uh, two few regimens. That is, the uh, we can give PPI, Combination of PPI, metronidazole, clarithromycin. Another regimen is PPI, amoxicillin, and clarithromycin. And okay. uh, if that doesn't, if it doesn't respond to this triple therapy, we can give the quadruple therapy, where we can add the bismuth. Ma'am. Okay. Can you name few other co uh, causes of uh, hypercalcemia? Yeah. Other than hyperparathyroidism, we, uh, we have malignancy. Which okay. could lead to hypercalcemia, renal failure, yes. uh, multiple myeloma, drugs like thiazide, diuretics, and, all. and sarcoidosis, etc. Okay. Yeah. Can you yeah. please tell me, uh, right, you said uh, it could be because of hyperparathyroidism. How would you confirm this diagnosis? Uh, what test would you carry out? Uh, I, I will need to do. I will need to do the, uh, firstly, since the calcium level is already done, and I yes. will do uh, uh, the CT MRI. I'll yes. do the maybe scan, okay. a technician 99 scan. I'll also do yeah, pre-op, pre -op, I'll do all these things. Okay. Can you please tell me uh, what is parathyroid adenoma? What type of yeah, condition is this? Parathyroid adenoma, it is a, a benign tumor of the parathyroid gland. Okay. How should that be managed? Uh, usually, uh, uh, usually, we can go for surgical excision, ma'am. Okay. If you can explain what type of surgery and what is the prerequisite, how would you do it? Is it possible to take any section uh, while doing the while performing the surgery? Yeah, we can do the frozen section biopsy. Okay, when and why frozen section biopsy is done? Yeah, because uh, 
to see the complete clearance. Uh, and also we can do the, uh, during the surgery, we can do the uh, parathyroid hormone level check. Okay. Can you and, please uh, tell me if you have taken the cytology and the histology of the parathyroid gland? What, are, what would be the features? Give at least three examples. Uh, yeah, in the adenoma, we we'll, uh, usually it is composed of uh, uh, polygonal chief cells with okay. the small central place nuclei. It can also uh, contain few nest of oxyphil cells and uh, less commonly can have the, uh, entirely it can be oxyphil type, that's the oxyphil adenoma. Uh, are these, and, uh, are these cytology you're telling me or histology features you're histology. telling me? Okay. Then, what would you see on cytology? Okay, you can say I'll um, come back to this I'll question to at the end. End. Okay, uh, just suppose you're trying to locate uh, the parathyroid gland. Can you please tell me if it's not present on its normal location, how would you locate it? I will usually look for it in the superior mediastinum now. Okay. Uh, how? Yeah, because I can do the... Yes, what are the I other contents the, of superior mediastinum? Uh, superior mediastinum, uh, we have the thymus. Yes. And uh, we have arch. the arch of, arch of outer. Yes. We have the uh, arch of outer, and then we have the uh, the trachea, which bifurcates to bronchi. We have the uh, uh, esophagus. We have, okay, uh, can you please tell me what is the treatment of... What is the treatment of hypercalcemia? Uh, hypercalcemia, initially we have to rehydrate the patient. Yes. Uh, dehydration is important. Then we'll start the patient, uh, give the patient uh, bisposonates. And uh, we can also uh, offer calcitonin. And All then right. in refractory cases, we can also go for dialysis. All right, good, thank you. Can you tell me the types of hyperparathyroidism? Uh, there are three types. We have yes. the primary, secondary, and tertiary, ma'am. Primary right. usually is yes. found in adenoma, where, there is, where the patient presents with hypercalcemia. Secondary, usually due to chronic renal failure, the patient will present with hypocalcemia. And then and... tertiary, usually due to chronic stimulation. And uh, here, the, the gland function autonomously due to the chronic stimulation, despite the removal of the stimulus. So in this case, patient has which type of hyperparathyroidism? Yeah, primary, ma'am, primary hyperparathyroidism. Thank you. And here is your question. Right, so if you have read and understood considering your surgical pathology patient, kindly tell me what would be your differential diagnosis for this patient? Yes, ma'am. My differential diagnosis would be basal cell carcinoma, squamous okay. cell carcinoma. Yes. I can keratoacanthoma and seborrheic keratosis. All right, okay. Can you tell me uh, how you came about uh, to this diagnosis? What does the lesion tells you about it? 
Yes, ma'am. It's a pearly papule with a central ulceration and rolled uh, roll in edges. Can you describe uh, the lesion you are looking at, please? Yes, ma'am. Uh, it's a papular lesion, pearly white raised uh, edges with uh, some amount of scaling, superficial yes. and uh, peripheral telangiectasia. Yes. If this condition or this lesion has to be, uh, has to be uh, cancerous, can you tell me how, what are the five uh, major steps that it will take to metastasize? Yes, ma'am. Uh, first, uh, it will uh, cause infiltration of the surrounding normal tissue. Yes. Then it will invade into the blood vessels. Uh, it yes. would survive in the circulation. Uh, then it would get trapped in the capillaries in the distant organs. And from there, it would again infiltrate into the distal organs and uh, cause growth uh, in the distant organs. Okay. Can you please tell me how would you differentiate or how would you confirm that it's uh, between basal cell carcinoma and the squamous cell carcinoma? Yes, ma'am. Uh, morphologically, basal cell carcinoma occurs usually uh, in the upper part of the body in the sun exposed areas. So uh, also same with the squamous cell carcinoma, but it usually occurs around the cavities like oral cavity on the nostrils. Yes. Uh, the, uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, the morphological appearance uh, wise, uh, the basal cell carcinoma has rolled in edges, pearly white or reddish colored papule. And it has an ulcer which easily bleeds. Uh, wherever squamous cell carcinoma, it is hard nodular lesion usually. Basal cell carcinoma occurs in the deep layers of the skin uh, and it arises from the basal uh, layers. Uh, squamous cell carcinoma usually arises from the middle and the upper layers, uh, upper layers of the skin. Okay, basal can you please tell me if you'll do the biopsy of this lesion, like the lesion I showed you, what kind of report uh, do you expect to find in the biopsy? Yes, ma'am. Uh, I would uh, find the mitotic lesions, uh, mito uh, uh, mitosis, and okay. uh, the ulceration, palisade. Okay. okay. Depth of invasion, maybe. Yes, ma'am. Can you tell me how, what is the natural history of basal cell carcinoma? How it develops? Yes, ma'am. Uh, it develops from the basal layers of the skin, uh, from the trichoblasts or an apocrine sebaceous units and it is very slow growing locally invasive tumor with very less potential to metastasize. It invades the surrounding tissues and uh, slow. Uh, it's a very slow growing tumor. Yes. Okay. Can you please tell me what are the treatment alternatives that can be offered for this patient? Yes, ma'am. Uh, so there are surgical options such as excision and primary closure or yes. curative and electrocautery. Yes. Also cryosurgery and most microscopic surgery. Yes. Uh, we can give uh, radiotherapy. Apart from that, we can give local photodynamic therapy with yes. uh, delta uh, alpha levulinic acid and uh, pre, uh, also topical agents such as imiquimone and flu fluorouracil, 5 fluorouracil. Can you please tell me what are the measures that can be taken to prevent the risk factors of May, uh, prevent the risk of having basal cell carcinoma that can yes, be advised to the patient? Yes, ma'am. Uh, uh, patient should be advised uh, to avoid uh, extreme exposure to the UV rays uh, like sunlight or tanning beds. Yes. Uh, they are advised to, if they are uh, supposed to go into sun, they should be using the sun blocks which protect against both UVA and UVB rays. Uh, and is, uh, it has SPF at least uh, better or uh, good than 30 SPF protection. Yes. Uh, uh, yes. And if they find any lesion, uh, they should any suspicious lesion, they should report uh, earlier so that uh, early intervention can be done. Good. Can you please tell me if you suspect or if you want to avoid, uh, if you want to avoid a remaining of the carcinoma, so what is the best method uh, to manage this uh, lesion? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry, ma'am. You'll uh, take the deep margins. Okay. okay, can you please tell me, since the patient has a lesion on uh, the nostrils, uh, 
and if you excise the lesion, there'll be a defect. How would you cover the defect or what, what alternative can you offer to the patient? Yes, ma'am. I would offer a patient uh, either a graft or full thickness or a flap surgery. Okay. Or a plastic surgical intervention and a, a, a reconstruction of the nostril. Okay. Uh, for reconstruction also, you would need a tissue. So what is the most common site for the graft or for the reconstruction tissue? Sorry, ma'am. I am not aware of this. I will okay. come back. All right. Uh, okay. Just suppose you took the graft and you grafted the lesion, and then uh, this lesion is not healing. What would you suspect? Yes, ma'am. I would suspect a surgical site infection. Okay. Um, yes. What is the most common organism which is found in surgical site infection? Oh, it's the Staph aureus and Staph epidermidis. Okay. Staph aureus. Okay. What should? How should that be managed? Yes, so uh, if uh, if the patient is my, it's a minor infection, then we can manage him on the OPD basis with oral antibiotics such as clindamycin, linzolin, amoxicillin, and tetracyclines. Yes, if there is localized collection of pus, then uh, it should be drained uh, with incision and drainage. If there is a moderate to severe infection, then we can admit the patient and start IV antibiotics such as linzolin, vancomycin, mm -hmm. and clindamycin. Since? Yes, no IV antibiotics yet. Okay, just suppose uh, you have given antibiotics oral and patient's infection is not uh, healing. So you do a culture and sensitivity test, which shows MRSA positive. So what does that tell you? How would you manage this patient now? Yes, ma'am. Uh, I would uh, give the antibiotics specific for uh, M uh, MRSA uh, according to the local trust policy. And also okay. I would do uh, decolonization of the patient with new py pyrocene nasal ointment and chlorhexidine -ex body wash. Okay. Yes. Uh, so what are the other medications? Oh, all right. Okay. You told me that. Okay. What other precautions would you take? Since yes, the patient is MRSA positive, yes, ma'am. I would maintain the like the local hygiene and uh, also yes. uh, daily dressings with uh, uh, under the sterile uh, condition. I would improve the patient's nutrition, hydration, and also took cultures whenever uh, it is indicated according to the hospital policy. And uh, I would treat uh, give antibiotics according to it. Good. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. This we have already discussed. 